next speaker is Sonia Kreidenweiss from Colorado State. Thank you, and I'd like to thank the organizers very much for inviting me to this session. And now for something somewhat completely different, I'd like to thank uh, the speakers before me for discussing um, quite extensively cloud microphysics and how aerosols impact that um, in models. And I'll be focusing more on actually looking at the aerosol field itself, and uh, my group mostly does observations, so it will be on an observational basis. And I'd like to thank Sue Vannon Heaver, um, who's a modeler in our department, for her many discussions. She's worked very hard on the RAMS microphysics schemes to look at how aerosols should impact that and to couple those together very tightly and through discussions with her, and hopefully learning what modelers want to know from observationalists. However, I want to stress that nothing that I say is Sue's fault. <laughs> Some of the discussion points I'd like to cover today. Um, first, how are CCN, quote unquote, represented in models, um, especially as guided by measurements and very much in the spirit of what Ken discussed? How can we use what we've now um, observed with respect to aerosol and CCN in many different environments to reduce the parameter space in a realistic way? So that speaks to that second point. What is a re reasonable range of CCN variability and how that might impact cloud formation, all else being equal? And then finally, a few words about meteorology, essentially. What factors determine whether CCN impacts are possible or even observable? So I begin with a disclaimer. The details of the aerosol chemical composition, particle mixing state within the population, things that um, atmospheric chemistry persons like myself really enjoy digging into are very key for many applications. These are important tracers of understanding aerosol sources, understanding life cycles, how mass is added and removed from the aerosol size distribution, especially on regional and global mass budgets. And they're indicators of atmospheric processing. As we look at the details of the chemistry size distribution, we can detect processes like cycling through clouds and fogs that are extremely important to understand. However, I'm going to collapse all that rich information, and I want to comment that um, many of the instruments that have been uh, developed to give us this kind of information, the aerosol time of flight mass spectrometer, aeros other aerosol mass spectrometer, single particle devices uh, provide all that detailed information. They're really fantastic. I'm going to collapse all of that into a very highly simplified approach and just talk about aerosol hygroscopicity as a couple of the speakers before me have also done. So we may have some representative composition of this single par particle, uh, pardon me, single compound, another single compound, Mixtures of them are very simply represented as mixtures of those two different hygroscopicities. And even if we have a largely insoluble portion to a particle, we can still apply that same framework to understand the overall hygroscopicity. And one of the advantages of that approach, it compresses that complexity, and it also gives us a reasonable range over which to consider water uptake by particles. So this hygroscopicity parameter can only vary between zero for something that is um, non-soluble, uh, non let's say, but still wettable, to about one for sea salt, which is about the most hygroscopic species that we have. So there's a limit to what we can assume for the water contents. So here are some typical observational data obtained by my group. These are from the Vasco cruise in the South China Sea a couple of years ago, and it's only two weeks of data, but it illustrates some of the observations um, that we've been trying to make to understand variability. So the top slide is the diameter of particles. This is a timeline, and the color contours basically show us the number uh, concentrations. And when you see the modes, at at particular diameter sizes, you can um, very readily pick out some similarities in what we observe in terms of what the aerosol looks like, especially over certain periods. Then it varies with other times. You can see here a time when it's been very strongly cleaned out. And tracing back the meteorology there, we know that that is an air mass that has come out of a deep convective event. This is, looks like a cold pool passage, and we can see the air being scrubbed of these fine particles. This is running from a point 0.1 to 1 micron here. The bottom plot is a second size measurement, an optical measurement that really looks at 100 nanometer to above 1 micron particles. 
There's about an order of magnitude less of these, but you can see it's picking up some of this variability here, and it's also seeing this supermicron mode. And for example, when we look in this time when it's been scrub free of accumulation mode particles, we can see that there's still some large particles there kicked up by the strong winds um, over the ocean surface. So there's a lot of information in looking at timelines, coupling that to the meteorology and that large scale setting to, to understand what's going on. So variability we see there reflects the varying sources of aerosol, something as simple as wind direction, Variable dilution rates, um, there's a lot of boundary layer free troposphere exchange that's happening uh, that we can't see directly. We're sitting at the surface, but we can see the impacts of that. And one example is here, this is um, smoke aloft that is being pulled down into the boundary layer. We see a very large increase in the accumulation mode particles in both of these signals. There's also scavenging by, by precipitation, like that example I showed you um, in the clean marine air mass. So the ideal is to take these kinds of data and simplify them down to provide representations um, for modeling that are based on the physics that we think we understand from looking at those timelines. And so a couple of examples from the timeline I just showed you are these two aerosol types that we pulled out. One is smoke impacted, and you can clearly see a very large um, mode fairly large particle size in this number size distribution, a little bit of a contribution from some smaller particles. And then a classical background marine aerosol, uh, bimodal, which indicates cloud processing, formation of small particles. A higher variability here between these two modes, but fairly um, consistent overall where these two modes are sitting. From our Data, we also have an idea of the composition, and so we can take this information on size and the composition of each of these modes and convert them into a cumulative CCN spectrum. So this is a plot of activated fraction as a function of supersaturation up to 1% supersaturation. For the smoke, you can see that there's a lot of um, sensitivity to the very low supersaturations because of where the size distribution sits and because it's also fairly hygroscopic despite being strongly smoke impacted. And so that by the time we're up to about 0.4%, we've essentially activated all of the particles that we've measured. By the way, these data points are direct CCN observations from our instruments, so we're fitting those observations quite well. In contrast, the clean marine um, has a much different slope, much different behavior, um, a lot of uh, change as we move from low supersaturations towards 1% supersaturations. So fundamentally, we would expect that as long as clouds um, have moderate to low updraft and their maximum supersaturations are somewhere in this range here, these should impact these clouds quite differently. So our thinking is that providing these types of data um, can help modelers to choose the types of uh, spectra with which to drive the number, uh, the number concentrations of droplets that are being simulated under these various conditions. So I'd like to look at a couple of the sensitivities now underneath these. These are again the clean marine and the smoke impacted size distributions. In this sensitivity, I have kept the size distribution of the smoke the same, but I varied the hygroscopicity between um, almost fully organic dominated to almost ionic species dominated, where our actual measurements were somewhere in between, as we might expect. And when we do that, we get this kind of a variation in the supersaturation spectrum. There's a fairly small change between our base mixed particle hygroscopicity and the fully ionic hygroscopicity. A larger change if we assume it's mostly organic dominated, but still this variation is about 50% in terms of the particles that would activate somewhere between 0.1 and 0.4 supersaturation. Changing the mode diameter, so I've taken the same distribution, looked at some of the variability in the data set, modified that from 0.16 to 0.23 microns from our best fit of 0.19 microns. And we see that there is a change in the supersaturation spectrum, but very little above this 0.3%, uh, where essentially almost all the particles have activated. And even below that, it's only about a 25% change. 
And we compare that, and I forgot to mention that all of these have been normalized, so we're just looking at the shapes, not the absolute amounts um, that are dictated to some extent by the dilution that's occurring. Compare that to the variations of total number having the similar shape of size distribution during those smoke impacted periods, which easily ranges between 1,000 and 3,500 per cubic centimeter. So we can see right away, as been pointed out before today, that the number of particles is probably more important than the details of exactly where the size mode sits and exactly what the hygroscopicity is, as long as we have those um, concepts about right. In fact, we can take combinations of mode diameter, assuming a log normal, so this is ranging between 0.01 and 1 micron, and hygroscopicity parameter, and find pairs of these that give exactly the same CCN supersaturation spectrum. So I actually calculated all four of these. They look exactly the same in this normalized space. So it tells us that there, there may be some range over which there isn't a lot of sensitivity, despite real variability in the atmospheric aerosol. And looking at some typical range of hygroscopicities between about 0.15 and 0.6, most of the observations that have been published now in many parts of the globe have a range in this um, space here. We find that diameters from about 0.06 to 0.08, um, if the median diameters are within that, we get uh, very similar spectra out of that, as we can see from that similarity line. So the question I ask, is it possible to define a limited number of representative CCN spectra, or re really a, ra a range of potential spectrum variability, reasonable range, that can be manifested in aerosol cloud interactions that may not be as large as it seems when we think about the true complexity of the atmospheric aerosol? And just to uh, make this point again, we, we look at these variations in diameter that I showed you before, changing hygroscopicity between 0.3 and 0.5, so this is just slightly organic influenced, and this is probably more than half organic influenced, we see that they all collapse into a similar spectrum, even for those different size distributions, assuming they vary in the same, the correct directions, of course. So really, number concentration appears to be the key parameter in understanding how aerosol links to CCN. If we look at the normalized distributions from the Vasco Cruz, I think we can see some of this um, playing out just in these timelines where we can definitely see a mode sitting here, some variability underneath that with where the mean size sits, but very easy to pick out visually these separate modes. And we change that into the activated fraction spectrum, the cumulative CCN, so we're going from low supersaturation to high supersaturation here, um, assuming a hygroscopicity for these size distributions. We can again see very similar ones popping out at certain times and other times um, a different. So more smoke influenced or pollution influenced and more marine type distributions. And in those plots on the curve, where, or the timeline where you see some very significant differences, we know why. These are the smoke impacts here and here. These are when the ship was actually in port and receiving a lot of anthropogenic pollution and they're clearly different. The non-normalized variability looks a lot more variable because of the number changes being put on top of that. And so just as an example, if we look at a supersaturation of 1% across this timeline here, we can see that there's variability from about 100 per cubic centimeter to more than 5,000 per cubic centimeter. Um, that is possible, but they're not always for the same aerosol type. Here's another example of timeline, and this is from the SGP site in the ARM database, um, where they have been for many years now taking CCN measurements at a number of different supersaturations, as well as a measurement of total particles. And so I've just simply plotted for um, these three days here the number concentration measured at each of these supersaturations, where these are the lowest supersaturations moving toward the highest, and then a separate measurement of the total particle number concentration. Sometimes that is close to the CCN at the highest supersaturation measured. Very often it's not. So I'm going to take a slice right here in this time period. Um, this happens to be a time when it was under um, a rather significant pollution. And take a look at the CCN spectra that were measured. 
And those are these data points from these four time periods out of the database. So we have um, this range of supersaturations and variability from 1,000 to not even a couple of thousand total particles um, in that time frame. And that fit that you see is just assuming a log normal single mode aerosol. It has a total particle concentration of 2,000 per cc, a mean size of 120 nanometers, sigma of 1.8, and a hygroscopicity of 0.15. And all of these were constrained from additional measurements at the ARM site. So there is an ACSM monitor of chemical composition taking the organic to sulfate fraction, and that gives us a cap of about about 0.15. Um, we have measurements of, of scattering that these measurements, dry scattering that these, uh, this fit is consistent with. So we have another constraint on what the total aerosol looks like. So from that fit, we've been able to do a pretty good job. We think it's physically realistic for what the aerosol looks like at that site. Is it really good enough if we consider the variability that might be underneath that with the clouds respond? And one, two important points. Down here, at low supersaturations, we virtually have no constraints. The model is putting quite a few particles at the low supersaturations, and does it really matter for a convective cloud? At this high size range, we also don't have a lot of constraints. We have the total number concentration, but no direct CCN measurements to understand whether those small particles that we're seeing in the excursions of total number from the actual CCN we intuitively put them at the largest supersaturations and think they're probably not good CCN because they're small particles, probably not really hygroscopic, but we don't really constrain them. And it may be possible, actually, to exceed 1% supersaturation, and they could, they could be accessed as CCN and changing cloud properties. So there's really not a good constraint there. In fact, the whole question of what happens between 1% and 10% supersaturation is something I've been kind of interested in, especially lately, although the plots I'm showing you here are all the way back from 1969, from some of Toomey's cumulative data, where you recall that they use this log-log scale to plot the cumulative CCN concentrations as a function of supersaturation, but the middle of all of these scales is 1% supersaturation, which is the maximum that we've typically been looking at um, with the modern-day instrumentation. And here, for their all-marine spectra, they're at about 100 at 1%, but they go quite a bit larger as we move higher. So those must be, if these are real observations, they must be small particles uh, and or less hygroscopic particles that are out there and really not being captured in a lot of our measurements. So this is time for my second disclaimer. Um, our group has done a lot of work with the new continuous flow CCN counter. It's been an exceptionally useful instrument, been deployed all over the world, and very importantly, people are getting data that is calibrated and taken the same way so we can intercompare CCN. But it does have a limited range over which it is giving us data, so we can understand this variability between these two very different types of um, CCN spectra but we don't have good constraints either for very um, weakly forced clouds or what happens here in stronger convection. Last, I'd like to just talk a little bit about how size distribution parameters are related. So these are timelines from also a very old study that we did in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. But I can show you recent data that show very similar characteristics. Namely, we've looked here over some a uh, number of weeks measuring aerosol size distributions, getting volume concentrations out of those size distributions, and you can see this variability that's captured in those measurements. Meteorologically, we know what's going on. There was a time here when a hurricane passed, the remnants of a hurricane passed through the site. It cleaned out. It was preceded by the strong stagnation event where aerosol just built up and built up, and we got very high mass concentrations. And the mean size responds. The mean size only gets really large when we have this kind of large mass loading and um, the conditions that allow the mass to build that strongly. Otherwise, the mean size tends to be fairly low under this kind of variability in total mass or total volume. If we look at the number concentration measurements that were made during that same period, we can see that they are not so strongly tied. We can get um, number concentrations of about 1,000, whether we have a lot of particles or relatively small volume concentrations. Um, 
And this just shows us how difficult it is to track, uh, to model the number concentration because the constraints on it are so much less. We really have to model all the physics of what's happening to that size distribution to do a good job on understanding the number concentration. And this is just the accumulation mode here. This is a point that I wanted to make about looking at particles that are larger than about half a micron into a couple of microns, especially when we try to understand them from an optical type of measurement, whether it's an AOD type measurement or um, some other one that relies on their scattering properties. And I'm sure this is all very well understood by the people who do remote sensing in the room. But in this case, I've taken um, 100 per cubic centimeter. I've put it into this aerosol, very typical aerosol size distribution. Uh, mean size just a little less than 100 nanometers, and calculated the scattering distribution. So which particles are responsible for the scattering signal? It is the ones above 100 uh, nanometers, as we know. If we translate this number into mass, we can see a lot stronger correlation between the scattering distribution and the mass distribution. And this is why uh, algorithms such as used in the improved network um, of national parks to go from mass concentration to visibility works so well because typically these two quantities are tied much better than a number concentration is tied. So this total mass is very low that's been assumed here. I added in one particle in a mode centered at one micron. That one particle has four times, uh, pardon me, 10 times the mass. Here's the new mass distribution of the original accumulation mode and now the new coarse mass mode, and it is totally dominating the scattering. So trying to understand optically how many of these large particles are there compared to the smaller ones, we can use other information, um, angular distributions, different wavelengths to tease that out. But I still contend it's a very difficult problem. And we do want to know a lot more about these larger particles, because when we think about how they interact with droplet formation, those are the ones that are presumed to grow initially into the larger droplets, creating spread in the droplet size distribution and helping to initiate precipitation. So they're quite important. And as will be talked about later, this is also the size range where a lot of ice nucleating particles are. So until we characterize this better and understand that mode better, it will be difficult to address some of those key questions. Last, can we expect the same environment to have different aerosol? So the classic ship track problem is one of the clearest indications that putting in more aerosol changes cloud droplet number concentration and hence reflectivity and all the impacts that we're looking for. But even with ship tracks, it's not just putting in particles. We're also putting in heat and having some other dynamical effects. And you know, this has been looked at in trying to understand those links within ship, ship tracks. More broadly, just going back to that Southern Great Plains example, um, we'd actually been looking at those data for trying to simulate mesoscale convective systems, which are a very important springtime phenomena in uh, the Great Plains area. The aerosol environment there is very interesting. If you look at an annual average of PM2.5, it's right on the gradient of what we think of as high loadings in the east coast of the United States that taper off towards the west, especially in the mountain west region. Coarse mass tends to have peaks in this part of the country because of agricultural dust and other sources of dust. So there is a quite rich uh, environment with a lot of potential variability here that is feeding into these clouds. If you look at the time period, um, in this case May, but any time through March and May, what is impacting the aerosol that is being ingested into storms, you can frequently see huge biomass burning events in Mexico. And this is where the NAPS model has put smoke near the surface during this particular uh, day in 2011, but you can find this almost consistently throughout the March and May period. When the meteorology is, is right, which happens frequently, this dust is being brought into this part of the United States, pardon me, this smoke is being brought into this part of the United States, and it's aloft. It's not necessarily seen at the surface. So those times in the timeline that I showed you where the number um, concentrations spiked, we think are times when some of the smoke was mixed down to the surface and we're actually observing it. However, the cloud can be ingesting the smoke at the higher levels throughout its formation time period. And so this very well could be impacting the storm. We're not really seeing that in the surface observations. With respect to feedbacks, um, there have been a lot of parametric studies that have tried to understand where sensitivities are. I take this one from Reuter et al. from 2009, 
where they varied aerosol number concentration just with a fixed size distribution, which seems perfectly fine based on what I've argued before, and changed updraft velocity, and found some regimes where um, here these are almost horizontal, and that means that uh, what is most important is the strength of the updraft in determining how many droplets are activated. Over here, these are almost vertical, which tells us we're just constrained by the number of particles we have, and the cloud's basically using them up because the updrafts are so strong, and the area of sensitivity is in between. So it's a very interesting study, but I would like to point out a couple of things. If we just do a very simple calculation of optical depths, and I'm just assuming these are dry particles, and I should have mentioned all along, all of our measurements are dried so that the water is taken out of that because it's a very complicating factor shifting the size distributions dramatically. A dry aerosol optical depth here already becomes 0.1 under these assumptions and heading up to one for this entire part of this um, parameter space. And under those conditions, there must be direct radiative impacts. So the same air masses that are bringing very large aerosol loadings must have their environment changed due to the fact those aerosol are there. And therefore, I suggest we, we don't really have as wide a range of variability as we may choose just by looking at the ranges and timelines. It really depends on the meteorology underlying that. So the aerosol ingestion pathway is extremely important, whether they're ingested in the developing cloud and storm from the boundary layer, from aloft, where those layers may be. Sue's group has shown that dust lofted in a gust front, for example, is not very readily pulled into the updrafts where it can, can affect microphysics. It just remains closer to the surface and so may not have as big an impact as you think. And she's been looking at hurricanes that form in dusty Atlantic air to also look at this and provided me this really cool animation. <laughs> so what they've done is put uh, aerosol source at different locations from the vortex of a developing storm and when the aerosol is too far away, it begins to be ingested, but it's just rained out in the rain bands, whereas when it's located at a different, condition, at a different position, it's pulled in and can actually invigorate um, the vortex through the interactions with the cloud microphysics. So in summary, um, I end with a quote from Albert Einstein. We want to make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler, which is the real challenge. Getting the aerosol number concentrations correct is quite important, but it's very difficult because it's not strongly related to the things that we measure most readily, which are mass concentrations or optical properties. And a huge question is whether ultrafine particles, which we usually dismiss as not CCN, are they able to serve as CCN? They're probably there in many um, environments. We see them very often in observations, and if the cloud is exhausted, all the other CCN and supersaturation still being generated, it may be reasonable that these are actually being accessed. When we have high aerosol concentrations, high enough to really begin impacting cloud microphysics in the, the way that we've parameterized those models, they probably have a direct radiative impact as well, so we can't really separate out those two effects. They have to be put together, and it, it means that it's very important to put high aerosol concentrations in the same correct place as where the cloud that we're interested in is forming. So if those aren't combined in the right uh, locations and right times, then we may predict that there's aerosol effects when there really aren't on a developing cloud. So a final point, meteorology and aerosol properties are not independent. And this, again, in the spirit of what Ken was saying, it probably limits the range of the possible inputs that we can put to examining aerosol indirect effects. Thanks for your attention.